Well, I welcome everybody back to uh, the virtual debate for Han Fellows. And again, really want to appreciate, really uh, thank everybody for supporting the program and for all the faculty's just incredible contribution for Fellows education in the last few months or so. This is actually going to be the last uh, virtual debate of the academic year as we wind down 2020 for our current fellows. So the topic this week will be on real nerve palsy and it could be moderated by Peter Reed from the Mayo Clinic. And we've had a couple of, uh, kind of cage matches the last few weeks. This is going to be a true face off between USC looking at tendon transfers, moder uh, mentored by Dr. Stavanovich versus nerve transfers with uh, Dr. Leversage as the mentor here. So from there, I'm gonna kind of pass off to Peter, but I just wanna give everybody an update. So again, we're gonna go on to a Wednesday month virtual debate just with new fellowship here starting and getting the fellows getting their feet wet and being pretty busy clinically. So it's gonna be the fourth Thursday of every month. So it doesn't conflict with the virtual uh, journal club that's been started by Megan uh, Conti as well as uh, Chris D with uh, Dr. Stern. Um, the first one is going to be end of August, um, instead of being a standard virtual debate, we're actually going to have a webinar um, being uh, hosted by Dr. Kakar Osterman and Gofarb, looking at wrist arthroscopy, tips and pearls. In September, October, um, working on the final schedule, we're looking at doing a flexor tendon uh, uh, repair and rehab webinar that's going to be more of a lecture-based and case-based, followed by the first virtual debate looking at distal radius fractures. So hopefully with the new uh, fellowship year starting pretty soon, we'll get everybody all excited to uh, continue the collaboration amongst institutions. And from here, I'm gonna pass it off to Peter Ray here. Thank you, Peter. Is that full screen for everyone? Yeah. Yep. All yes, right. Thank you. All right. Um, so the um, radial nerve palsy, it's, it's one of the most common uh, uh, palsies that we see, um, mainly probably in, in, our, in our world, it's mainly because of uh, long bone fracture, humerus fracture, but could be for a lot of reasons, um, for trauma, hyrogenic, tumor, what have you. Um, it's just a good time to remind you that the radial nerve comes off the posterior cord. It's a terminal branch off the posterior cord, which then splits off to the axillary or the radial, and then from there, um, the radial nerve splits into the PIN and the SBRN. There are a couple of uh, important anatomic areas uh, to consider as, as the radial nerve courses through the upper extremity. It goes through the triangular interval and then around the spiral groove. And then it pierces through the lateral intermuscular septum, uh, approximately around 12 centimeters proximal to lateral condyle. And then just distal to the joint, then it splits into the SBRN and the PIN. And the PIN then also goes under the arcade of Froge. Um, there's a lot of variability though. Um, the innervation is also quite important, but as you can see here, um, if you have a humerus fracture or even from uh, errant retractors, let's say posterior approach to the humerus, um, rotator cuff, total shoulders, it's, uh, it's, it's a high value real estate in this area where the radial nerve could get injured. Also, in the forearm, too, as this becomes a PIN, a lot of different places it can get injured, too, um, whether it's from trauma again or even from your surgical approach from a, a Thompson approach. <clears throat> the innervation is important just so you can track and, uh, well, most importantly, evaluate patients and then track their recovery. Um, this is just a good, good uh, figure to know, just the fact that the EIP is typically the last to re -innervate. But this is helpful. You can kind of track along the patient's uh, reco neuro recovery after uh, an injury. So I thought we'd start with a case example here. Here's a patient who had this uh, open humerus fracture, um, nothing fishy, no polytrauma, left upper extremity. And he has this fracture here too. This is a blast injury. And uh, in, once everything was clean um, and you're looking at the nerve, it's about a 20 centimeter nerve uh, defect, pretty large once you get out of the zone of injury. And so for this patient, uh, just did soft tissue coverage with this uh, rotational uh, latissimus, then eventually uh, staged him because he was quite contaminated and then fixed him. So then the question is, you know, assuming, which, which you did, heal the humerus fracture, then what do you do with this radial nerve palsy? Um, 
So, uh, Jerry, maybe we can try poll number one here for everyone that's watching. Right. So everybody see the poll on there? Yes. So if you could just answer this question number one at this stage. So what would you do? So let's say this is oh, about three months out after the injury. Um, would you do just non-off treatment? Oh, let's say six months. Six months, nothing else is coming back. And you're pretty sure that um, you know that the nerve is out because it's, 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 it's transected. So would you just continue non-op in this young patient? Do uh, tendon transfer, nerve transfer? So let's pre-debate. Let's see what everyone thinks. How old is the patient? Uh, I believe he was about 24 or so. I can't remember. I would graft it that to the cerebral nerve graft. Okay. Or <laughs> oxygen if patient has a problem. Uh, that, that was not an option, but that, uh, I think that, that goes into a whole different uh, debate, which, which I agree with you, uh, that nerve reconstruction uh, could be a very viable option in the early setting. But let's say if it's just a non-op versus tendon transfer, nerve transfer. Just so, yeah, folks actually start voting, make sure it's working there. Votes are coming in. The suspense. Uh oh. So yeah, if everybody could vote, I think we only have two votes, three votes so far. Poll is live and going. It doesn't want to submit when I press submit. Oh really? No. Yeah, it it um submits on an option. At the very bottom of the poll, it, it had a submit button. Oh, you have to answer every question. Oh, I'm sorry. That's, oh, shoot. That's okay. That's okay. We can just, it can just be a, uh, a poll to yourself, and then you can uh, interject if necessary. Yeah, so after this one, Peter, I'll delete at least the uh, bottom. So the poll number two is five, five, number five and six. So at least I'll delete the other questions so people aren't forced to vote on every answer here so sure sure no problem if, if it doesn't work that's that's fine okay uh, so to answer that question we have uh, dr falk from university of colorado uh, on the stance of nerve transfer for real nerve palsy and dr Kristen sokol uh, from usc talking about tendon transfers and their mentors um, for these are dr lever said she was a visiting professor for us and also Dr. Stevanovich, who was also a visiting professor for us at Mayo. So thank you very much. So how about we start with um, Wade with nerve transfers. Hey, Peter, do you want people to answer questions? Look at just the poll answers for number one and two. Oh, if, if, if you- stage And what did you do with the nerve? I could launch the uh, results right now if you like. Sure. So yeah, the question number one was, what would you do? Number two is, what do you do with the nerve itself? Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch that there. Uh, and the results for, here's at least number one and two. Okay. So nerve transfers was, was a hot option. Acute reconstruction for a 20 centimeter nerve defect. Okay. Nothing. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and change it, Peter, so at least it's broken up for the other questions for you, so. Okay, if it's, if it's not too much trouble, yeah, of it is then. All right, oh. so I'm gonna let the, uh, Fellows, take it from here, and I'll do the editing from there, so. Perfect. All right. So I'm just gonna share my screen. Hopefully it'll come up quickly. Oops. Is that coming up for everybody? Yeah. Looks great. Okay, perfect. All right, so I'll just get started. Uh, jump right in. Thanks for everyone for being on and, and having me. So uh, clinical cases describing the finding of radial nerve palsy of various etiologies have been presented in the literature since 1863. And of those various etiologies, trauma has evolved as a particularly important cause of radial nerve injury, as Dr. Reed has stated previously. The radial nerve is injured through orthopedic injury more than any other major nerve with about 12% of humeral shaft fractures being complicated by radial nerve paralysis. So what are the treatment options with high radial nerve injury? 
Uh, one is tendon transfers, which has gained support for the treatment of radial nerve paralysis and are considered a reliable method of reconstruction. However, this has been assumed based uh, largely upon subjective evaluations and uncontrolled series that have failed to separate radial from PIN lesions. Moreover, some previously reported patients had tendon transfer surgery within weeks of their injury. And considering that after a humeral fracture with a radial nerve palsy, spontaneous recovery of radial nerve function, maybe not in the example case, but in many others, may take months to occur, these favorable results might reflect a combination of tendon transfer success and spontaneous nerve recovery combined. More recently, nerve transfers have been proposed for radial nerve paralysis reconstruction, and we'll be defending this technique today. So the anatomy of the radial nerve, you all know this, so I won't go over everything, but it innervates all the muscles listed here. These function for elbow extension, forearm supination, wrist extension, finger extension, thumb abduction, and thumb extension. And loss causes great disability. One loses the ability to effectively grasp objects since the wrist and digits cannot be extended. So the goals of treatment in uh, treating high radial nerve injury with nerve transfers are functional recovery, consistent predictable outcomes, to minimize risk, minimize donor morbidity, and to not burn any bridges. In this quick talk, we'd like to give you a perspective on our rationale for nerve transfers and discuss some of the anatomic reconstruction principles to argue for nerve transfer, show the feasibility of these nerve transfers without the need for graft, discuss the synergistic principles behind the nerve transfers, talk about some of the outcomes of nerve transfers and how they avoid the limitations of tendon transfer, and point out that salvage procedures still remain after nerve transfer surgery. So we can all agree that the anatomy of the human body and particularly the upper extremity is absolutely amazing. That's why we all went into hand surgery. So we see here the intricate branching of the PIN to the individual muscles that perform independent functions. These functions and specific combinations give us the ability to perform complex functions and movements. And each of these muscles has have different values for tension, force, and excursion. One tendon equals one function, as Dr. Paul Brand talked about, and that is the goal in nerve transfer surgery. So this is opposed to the tenodesis effect of tendon transfers. Dr. Leversedge said he had asked for intraoperative pictures of Dr. Stavanovich doing a tendon transfer, and apparently the picture on the right is what got sent. And per Dr. Leversedge, tendon transfer alone is basically like k-wiring all of the digits together. In addition to having one tendon performing one function with re you also maintain the correct line of pull, as well as the anatomic excursion and tissue balancing. Many times with tendon transfers, the donor tendon muscle unit does not have the same excursion as the muscles you are transferring to, and it may therefore create a, uh, a tether. So tendon transfer is not like to like. Finally, surgery itself is not benign, and there is a zone of surgical injury. For nerve transfers, the surgical area is typically away from the area of tendon gliding, in tendon transfer surgery, the zone of surgical injury violates areas where the tendons are expected to glide back and forth. So you might ask, how are the nerves going to be transferred without severe loss of function of the donor, and how can you do it without graft? So there are many studies, uh, particularly by Dr. Jaime Bertelli and Dr. Susan McKinnon, that look at the variability in anatomy and the anatomic feasibility of these surgeries. Based on this Tongue and McKinnon study from 2001, we see the number of different nerve branches to each donor muscle. So PT two to four, FDS two to three, FCR had a single branch in all specimens in this study and PQ had a single branch. But you can modify your donor based on dissection and the number of donor muscle branches. The important thing is synergistic firing and re-education during rehab. And if you educate the patient preoperatively um, properly and you are not satisfied with nerve transferability during surgery, you can as these studies illustrate, perform a tendon transfer as well. But note that this is a salvage procedure rather than an optimal procedure choice. So at times these nerve transfers can even cover large distances. In this study by Pertelli et al, they looked at the transfer of the PQ motor branch to the nerve of the ECRB for wrist extension reconstruction, 20 cadaveric limbs for anatomic feasibility, four patients with lesions causing paralysis of wrist finger extension and operated on within 10 months of trauma and they were followed up for 12 months after surgery. The length of the AIN was approximately 80 millimeters, allowing for direct transfer to the nerve to the ECRB with redundant length, and a minimum 12-month follow-up. Uh, pronation scored four out of five, and all patients recovered active extension, scoring four out of five with independent motor control. The relearning process may be simplified by choosing actions that are synergistic, those that are fired in the same phase of grasp or release, 
So wrist extension and finger flexion or synergistic movements as our wrist flexion and finger extension as our forearm pronation and wrist extension. And since these transfers utilize synergistic movements, the patient can be taught to attempt co-contraction of donor and recipient muscles in an attempt to initiate development of the new motor pathway for the recipient muscle. So anatomic reconstruction and improvement of ultimate outcomes with therapy. The functional goal and advantage of nerve transfers is to avoid the tenodesis effect of the tendon transfers. So pull of the transferred FCU results in tenodesis of the EDC with digits two through five extension occurring simultaneously. As was alluded to before, this is kind of like K-wiring all of these digits together. Our goal is not to just extend the digits, but as Dr. Ann Van He stated in the ASSH tendon transfer surgery textbook, the epitome of hand surgery is to provide function where there once was none. So we not only want to provide function, but if we can, we'd like to maximize one's ability to perform independent digit manipulation once again and get closer to the example on the top right rather than the one below it. So let's look at some outcomes. This is a Bertelli study very recently, JHS May 2020. It's an objective comparison of nerve transfers versus tendon transfers and high radial nerve lesions. Nerve transfers had 14 patients, AIN to the nerve to the ER, uh, ECRB and the nerve to the FCR to the PIN. Tendon transfers had 13 patients, PT to ECRB, FCU to EDC and PL to EPL. In comparison of wrist flexion, extension range of motion and grasp strength, there was better recovery in nerve transfer than tendon transfer. Half of the patients in the tendon transfer group needed to flex their wrist in order to fully extend their fingers, whereas finger extension was possible in all uh, patients with the wrist either extended or at neutral. And grip strength recovery was 58%, that of the normal side in the nerve transfer group, and 43% in the tendon transfer group. This is Ray and McKinnon, JHS 2012, 19 patients, FDS to ECRB, FCR to PIN, 18 patients regained motor strength, four out of five wrist extension, and 14 patients got back their ability to extend their fingers and thumb independently. Of note with this study, they also used PT to ECRB tendon transfer without cutting ECRB, which is a technique that Dr. Leversedge also uses. This gives the immediate ability to extend the wrist but limited excursion. Then with re of ECRB with the nerve transfer, one will subsequently gain improved excursion and function. Finally, salvage remains feasible in nerve transfers as a first option. If you do a nerve transfer, typically the donor muscle has multiple fascicles and you are only using one. Thus, you can still use that muscle later for tendon transfer if necessary as a salvage procedure and you don't burn that bridge from the get-go. So consider nerve transfers. They may actually help you sleep better at night so you don't have to sleep between cases. And there's a plain winner in this debate. So with that, I'll gladly stop talking and uh, give the floor back to you guys. Thank you very much. Great talk. Wade, that was, that was nice, man. <laughs> that, was a, that was a great review of nerve transfers. Um, uh, and it looks like most of the, the majority of the audience already was thinking about nerve transfers as their option. So how about Kristen? Let's see if you can uh, swing, swing the uh, tide here. I will do exactly that. Hi, everyone. So my talk is on tendon transfers. I'm Kristen Sokol. I want to say thank you first to Dr. Wang and to all the other mentors around the country for taking the time to participate in these. Thanks, Dr. Reed, Dr. Leversedge, and especially Dr. Stavanovich for sharing your cases. So anyone who knows me knows that I'm excited about nerve transfers, but this is a situation where I keep it old school. I give respect to the pioneers of hand surgery. Tendon transfers work in every occasion and they're without question the optimal treatment here. So I'm gonna show all of you some cases where the outcomes will speak for themselves. And if you're thinking nerve transfers now, by the end of this talk, you're definitely gonna be thinking tendon transfers. Uh, I'm gonna skip through these anatomy and prevalence uh, slides because we've already kind of discussed some of that. Uh, so which one should you go with? Well, even the surgeons at Mayo Clinic um, in PRS have said that they do tendon transfers without ever, um, if they cannot do primary repair or grafting. And a 2019 Yellow Journal article regarding this topic mentions that many hand surgeons will even choose tendon transfers without ever even exploring the nerve for repair because the outcomes are so good and so reliable. And when you look at the clinical data on the nerve transfers closely, Dr. McKinnon gives many of her patients tendon transfers for wrist extension which completely confounds the results. And those results thus far have been unacceptable in comparison to tendon transfers anyway. 
In a, subsequent, in a subsequent paper, even Dr. McKinnon writes that she does about five tendon transfers for every nerve transfer she does. So what are they? Tendon transfers are the relocation of a functioning muscle tendon unit to restore lost motion and function at another site. Why do we do them? Uh, they give you a more rapid recovery than any nerve procedure. They restore function in late presentations when no nerve options exist, and the results are comparable to nerve repair, reconstruction, or transfer. You should already know the principles regarding tendon transfers, uh, and they're, they're extremely important, and they're listed here for your review. The most commonly used group of transfers is the brand transfer, and this is what we prefer here at USC, using the FCR for finger extension. The Jones transfer uses the FCU, and this was actually described over 100 years ago. The founder of our fellowship at USC, Joseph Boys, he preferred to use the FDS for finger extension. So this here is a patient who had a high radial nerve palsy. Here are clinical photos showing our incisions to use to perform our transfers. It's important to note that when you're exposing the pronator to elevate it off its insertion from the radius and to take a slip of the periosteum for length and to free it up maximally to gain your best excursion. We dissect out all the tendons first and then perform pulver tap leads, doing the wrist extensors last. It's also important to note that after you dissect the EPL, you must pass it volarly to allow for the best line of pull. Setting the tensions well is the most critical part of this case. After all of our weaves are performed, the wrist and fingers are taken through a range of motion to ensure correct uh, strength of the repair and tension. So this is that same patient at six months follow-up. Looks pretty good to me. This is a case of a six-year-old female uh, so she had a closed humeral shaft fracture. She didn't present to us actually until 14 months after her injury. Uh, so when her nerve was explored, she was found to have an 18 centimeter defect of the nerve. So she underwent primary tendon transfers. This was her follow-up at three months, and this is her follow-up at 11 years. 11 years. She's actually in high school now. She's a cheerleader and she um, is a position of a base. So she used her wrist extension and uh, strength to hold up other members of her squad. So it's important to talk about the timing of transfers as well, especially to consider in complex injuries. In certain situations, you have to do these acutely or semi-acutely um, for regarding cover coverage for specific patients. So this is a patient who had a very bad injury, who had exposed FCR volarly and bone and soft tissue defects dorsally, who at the same time as undergoing uh, bone fixation, uh, got a free gracilis uh, done for coverage and tendon transfers. So this is a nine month follow up. Looks pretty good to me as well. Uh, so here's another trauma patient where the transfers were done in a sub more subacute fashion because after the bones were fixed, the wound had to be IND'd and a groin flap was done. So after the groin flap was separated, uh, the tendon transfers could then be done. And these are some pictures of our fixation as well as two year follow up for this patient. So in addition to working in pediatric patients and complex trauma patients, uh, Dr. Frances Sharp, a former voice fellow, shared her cases in elderly patients to show us that there are no age limits to tendon transfers. So the first case is an 86-year-old male who had a right humerus fracture. Uh, this was uh, fixed uh, in April of 2016. Six months later, the patient underwent uh, tendon transfers. This is his follow-up at one year, good wrist and finger uh, and thumb extension. And just to show you, we have another elderly case. Uh, this is a 76-year-old male who had a radial nerve palsy after a revision shoulder arthroplasty. He's a working contractor. Uh, he had no recovery at eight months post-op. So we were actually able to get his nine-year follow-up, nine years after tendon transfers. So there's his finger extension, his thumb extension. It looks pretty good. So. I wanted to talk about the comparison of nerve transfers to tendon transfers, but in my opinion, there's not really uh, much of a comparison. Tendon transfers, they work for any age, they work for any time uh, limit, you know, they're faster rehab, faster return to function, independent finger extension is not really noticeable. Uh, it's well described, it's reproducible as long as you set the right tension um, and, and you know how to do the procedure. It's tried and true. 
And this is what we do here at USC if we can't primary repair or reconstruct the nerve. Thank you. Nice, Kristen, way to represent the uh, West Coast there. The, um, I think both were awesome. You guys did an awesome job presenting these things. Um, it's, uh, this is probably one of those palsies that um, this question is, it's at least now, I think in hand surgery, it's, it's one that has a lot of controversy because tendon transfers, whether you use uh, the FCR based um, or FDS based, they're so reliable. And so the question is why, why do a nerve transfer? Um, the, the benefits uh, Wade really showed uh, nicely. So I guess my question first directed at Frazier would be when a tendon transfer is so reliable and even in the best of hands, let's say a neurophy, let's say there's a 5% failure rate for a direct coaptation of a nerve transfer. And let's say there's a 5% failure rate with the tendon transfer, that's immediate. Uh, and if it does rupture, you can see it, you know it, you're not waiting. So my question is, when would you not do a nerve transfer um, and do a tendon transfer? I guess, what is your algorithm for who gets a nerve transfer versus a tendon transfer? That's a great question, and uh, to both of the presenters, both fellows, um, great job because I think you you both covered the topic well, but also made made very uh, succinct points about uh, favoring one versus the other. And I think it actually brings up really the answer to my question to you, Peter. You know, I think this is a this is one of those decisions for nerve transfers where patient selection is really critical, both in terms of the patient education and understanding. Um, the time that it might take for nerve recovery, um, the potential for failure, uh, what your options are, um, and also what the patient expectations are, because for sure, uh, I think tendon transfers are so reliable in general to get very reasonable recovery. So the, the, the individualization goes through a discussion with the patient about how important it is for individual finger function. I think that's a, an important part of probably the most important decision-making uh, factor. So if you take the older patients that uh, were presented by Kristen, you know, for, we wanna get those patients back to safe ambulation. We wanna get them back to, to, to safety for their functional activities. They probably have less of a need for individual finger function compared to somebody who may be younger, who's got a lifetime ahead of them of doing, of doing uh, uh, perhaps more uh, delicate and more dexterous related activities. So the other part of it is the zone of injury. And I think that the zone of injury will often let us know what we have as a donor being either tendon transfer opportunities or nerve transfer opportunities. And that can make a, a significant difference as well. If you consider the, the radiographs that were shown in several of the cases with, with distal, forearm uh, uh, distal forearm trauma, um, those may influence your, your decision-making about taking healthy tendons and moving them into a zone of injury. So I, I, I think that's, those are the two characteristics that I think are important. Um, age is obviously one of those things that guide us in terms of nerve transfers for nerve repair uh, outcomes as well. That's a great point. It's something that I didn't really think about is the, uh, the zone of injury, like you just mentioned, where uh, is it really a hospitable bed for you to go acutely or stage to try to provide a gliding surface for your tendon versus um, you know, leaving it alone and utilizing that native tissue for tendon gliding. Uh, Dr. Stevanovich, um, after hearing the nerve transfer uh, portion uh, debate and also just what's in the literature, is there any role uh, in your practice, in your hands, to do a nerve transfer for radial nerve palsy? Oh, I think uh, it is. Uh, depend on the profession of the patient, the age of the patient. If somebody is a piano player, I would uh, prefer do nerve transfer than uh, uh, do the tendon transfer. Also, the mechanism of injury is very important. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> nerve transfer has a, a role in a certain you know age, a certain type of injury and profession, as I said. But uh, this is a horse that win every race. Uh, as far as me concern, uh, tendon transfer. And uh, if somebody thinks that's a simple procedure, I think it is not. And uh, when somebody asked me how one doctor has better results than another, I said, if you take uh, five girls that finish 
uh, <coughs> high school with a straight A and put them in the cooking course. Uh, and after five weeks, you give them the recipe. So two cakes will be nice. Uh, one will be, you know, uh, probably acceptable, but another uh, two will be terrible. So I think you have to have experience. And when they ask you how you gain that good results is that, uh, you know, mastering how much uh, uh, tighten uh, tendon you have to leave after you finish the surgery. So that's the most important part uh, of all this procedure right. and transfer. Got it. And it's for every age, you know, you for the kids, uh, for the adults. Uh, but uh, I think in the narrow for the nerve transfer is very low. Thank you for your insight. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to go back to uh, here now. Um, Jerry, maybe, do you, do you have a poll one again as a yeah, separate? I have a question for you now. So now, it, now let's see where uh, the percentages lie. OK. Uh, looks like the pendulum is swinging after the uh, debate. Ooh, you, you, you can't tease us like that, man. You gotta, <laughs> sh you gotta show us the numbers. All right, I'm gonna close in five, four, three, two, one. Polls close, and here's results. Ah. Okay, interesting, interesting, nice. You guys, you both, Wade and Kristen, you guys did an amazing job. Thank you for putting that together. Um, well, here, so in this case here, um, just for the sake of time for this case, because I have a couple other cases we can talk about. I thought that 20 centimeter uh, defect was just too large in this area that needed a, um, uh, a free tissue, uh, a tissue transfer, a pedicle tissue transfer. And so I, from the get-go, knew that in my ultimate plan, he was going to get uh, something for his tendon uh, for his real nerve palsy, which in my hands here, it was a tendon transfer. Um, but Kristen actually made a good point is that if you use the FCR base, which I think is probably one of the more popular ones, um, it will, um, you know, you're asking a tendon with typically an excursion of three centimeters to do the work of a finger extensor that has about five centimeters. So you often have to flex your wrist down to get full extension. That's very important to talk with the patient because if someone really, you know, for instance, like a plumber or someone has to get underneath a sink and bend their wrist or extend their wrist, they may not have the full finger extension where nerve transfer may be a good option, but just something to consider. Um, and then in this young guy, um, I think he recovered pretty well. And, and just like Kristen showed in her cases, even though we talk about the FCR having um, uh, less of an excursion where you may have to flex your wrist, but a lot of those cases that you showed, Kristen, um, their wrist function will look pretty sweet with uh, full active extension of their fingers. So always something to consider. So here's another case, um, somewhat similar. This is a closed injury from a motor vehicle accident. And uh, my trauma partners uh, decided to fix this, which I think is, is a good option, the segmental closed uh, injury. And they fix this with this long play, but intraoperatively, uh, having never met the patient or even knew about this case, they said, hey, can you come in? Because the nerve is, is cut. And I said, did you cut it? And like, no, <laughs> the fracture cut. I was like, okay. Um, so then at this point here, once I looked at the zone of injury, uh, the defect itself measures about three centimeters here. Um, here's pole number two. What would you do with this three centimeter radial nerve defect? And the first question really is, if you're going to reconstruct the nerve, which I think most people would uh, at some point because it's there, just even if you were to get um, some sort of protective sensation or even take care of neuroma pain, um, I think most people would. So would you do this acutely at this stage or stage it or just leave it alone and say, you know, it's probably nerve reconstruction is not going to work and you'll do something else down the road. Peter, this is, this is Fraser. I, I wonder if your trauma folks uh, were kinder to you that they would have, they would have allowed you maybe to even consider shortening the humerus. Yeah. 
<laughs> exactly, exactly. That would have that would have been a great pearl. Um, and everyone, you should know that for a lot of these nerve defects that are somewhat small, there are some workarounds that you can try to gain some length on. And for um, this type of injury at this level, you could do that. But no, you're right. You're right, Frazier. It was a uh, uh, didn't really they didn't really give me that option. All right, so maybe just what do you think, Jerry? All right, so polls in you right now. So here are the results. All right. All right, so 90% said acute reconstruction, 10% said staged. And I felt like that was a good option. I think the question was, um, you know, once – I'm going to go back here. You can see that nerve here is really hemorrhagic, and it almost kind of just tapers out. And so I wanted to do acute reconstruction, um, and I felt like I really couldn't do that until I got to what looked like healthy appearing fascicles at this time, time zero, which also is quite difficult. And – um, you know, once we, uh, once I trimmed out to the point that I felt like it looked good, um, it was about eight centimeters, which may have been a little overly aggressive, but just in my experience with these type of injuries, um, just being more aggressive, you know, and changing it from a four centimeter grab to five or whatnot, I think it's worth it to get out of the zone of injury. So here's eight centimeter nerve defect. So the question is now pull three which I know is a little of a tangent um, to the overall topic, but I think it's worth mentioning. All right, Jerry, let's try poll three. All right, so poll three is launching now as far as how do you reconstruct a nerve defect? Okay, eight centimeters. Radial nerve. Mid shaft. All right, voting's coming in. And close in about five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, and polls closed. And the results are all right. So eighty-four percent said uh, autograph nerve. Sixteen uh, percent said allograph nerve. Okay, um, and I think probably uh, that is the that is the right answer, um, or not the right answer. It could be any of them. Uh, I think that's what I would have done. But the fact was, I never met this patient. The leg wasn't prepped out. I never talked about any of this. And so I felt like um, in this situation, I could feel ethically okay to say that on this intraoperative consultation that I wanted to do something right there, even though it's a mixed motor nerve. Um, I thought an allograft nerve would be uh, a good option here. So I did that for this eight centimeter nerve defect. And then uh, let's say at this point, um, about six months down the road, um, let's say her physical exam is not quite, uh, quite consistent with full recovery, um, and you're still questioning it, what, when would you get your, I guess, when would you get your nerve test? So would you get something immediately after you reconstruct, three to six weeks to get a baseline, or get at least three months just to just to see, or would you even get one in August? That wasn't an answer. Well, I have a question before that. How you got, to, uh, got to eight centimeters when the maximum one is a seven centimeters by accident? Ah, yep, yes, good point. I had to uh, so-called daisy chain them together and put the, uh, put, put two uh, similar size diameters together. Oh, I see. Okay, so the question, the, the question was, when would you get for just a nerve injury and this reconstructed here, if you're gonna get an electrodiagnostic study, when? And most people said at least three months. And um, I think for me, that's probably what I would do. Um, and, and if any of the uh, attendings that are in attendance, if you have any comments, please feel free to share. Um, but My ass assessing the nerve regrowth uh, is a tinnel sign more important than anything else. So if I don't see the tinnel sign is progressing, I know the EMG will be probably the same results. So Absolutely. I always do tinnel sign, and I think it's a very important sign, a very easy, you know, test. And as Dr. Stevanovich is mentioning, the tinnel is it, it's not a good marker of where your nerve regeneration is or potentially where it stopped too. And so the tinnel needs to be advancing with serial exams. Yeah. Okay, and so at six months, uh, I saw her back and 
this was her uh, nerve conduction study. So it's on the left. So nothing in the motor conduction uh, studies, nothing in the sensory on the left either for the radial. Everything else looks fine. And then for the EMG, just as you would expect, um, there's increased insertional activity. So a hyper irritable nerve, also fibrillations um, for the radial nerve innervated muscles, and then also uh, no activation here. Uh, triceps probably because uh, of the surgical trauma too. So at this point, uh, I said, well, let's just keep observing because I reconstructed it. It felt like there was an advancing tenels and at least at nine months, she has a tenels that has advanced to her um, just around the level of her mobile wad, but mainly um, you know, shooting down into her SBRN distribution. Her triceps is uh, pretty good function, four plus, uh, other than just a tiny, tiny flicker of um, nothing really meaningful. I put one minus just to give it something because I think I saw something, but otherwise, the rest of the radial nerve innervated muscles um, from the elbow down are, are not firing, uh, but everything that you would potentially need for a tendon transfer or nerve transfer is also firing. So at this point, let's go to pull five again. All right, so exact same question in this patient now. She's young, I, I think she was in her 20s. Actually, this was back when I was in the military. I think she was just on reserve duty and they flipped her Humvee. And so she's very active, um, wants the best outcome possible. So how about here? What would, would this change? Because I know both speaker, both mentors mentioned it's, it's patient. It's a patient uh, driven decision. Uh, Peter, in yes. my, I have been for the last 12 years uh, using uh, uh, oxygen graft and uh, I found out that uh, recovery, motor recovery with oxygen graft is uh, probably double than with uh, sural nerve graft. So I wouldn't uh, think uh, that if you wait a little more, uh, could happen that uh, she will get. I remember a patient, I did a six centimeters for posterior enterosis nerve grafting, six months, nothing, nine months, nothing. And I told her, come to the, for the tenant transfer. She came a year later, full extension of the fingers and thumb. So I think uh, you have to be patient more. I, I would, uh, because she's young and uh, probably she will lose about five, six months, but if you recover is a, a benefit. You're absolutely right. I think uh, the, the nerve reconstruction is done. So um, if you do a tendon transfer, um, then, you know, you have the, whatever time you need as long as the joint stays supple um, so um, absolutely you could, you could certainly wait on this looks like fairly even split 44 percent said tendon transfer 30 percent said nerve transfer uh, i'm just curious fraser at this point having reconstructed with this allograft nerve um, about eight centimeters or so at nine months really not much other than just a little flicker i i'm wishful thinking maybe there in the wrist extensors, would you still wait? Or at this time, if you want to do a nerve transfer, would you just, would you uh, pull the trigger so that you can re these motor end plates? That's a, that's a great question. I, I, so in this patient in particular, and I think for, for everyone who follows along with nerve recovery, and sometimes as trainees, you don't see the patient over an extended period of time. Um, this is a great example of progress is our good measure of what to do as a next step. And you've, I think you've shown here that the patient's got an advancing tenels and you're starting to see some uh, early motor recovery potential. So this would be a patient that I would say we've seen some recovery. We've, in a sense, committed to this process of watching to see what happens with the nerve reconstruction that you've done. And I think if you've started to see some nerve recovery, then another point in time, would be a good next step in terms of decision making because I think it, you know obviously if the patient's not willing to wait that's a different story but I think you can encourage them at this point that there's a good sign sign of some nerve recovery and then maybe see them back in another two months or so where you can maybe start to see a little bit more wrist extension and I would agree with with Milan that 
uh, we actually, uh, Alex Lauder, who, who's one of our uh, staff, but was a fellow with us, just published an, an article, a case study on, on a segmental nerve reconstruction, the radial nerve. And at this point, we were just starting to see the, the motor recovery. And I would agree with Milan that it seems like the allograft takes maybe a little bit longer to, to actually get um, motor re -innervation. Got so it. I, I would wait with this for a little bit longer. Yeah, and and uh, I had that exact discussion with her. You know, the fact that we committed down this road, and I thought that at least her um, SBRN was tracking down. So I I recommended just waiting. Uh, she was young, and she was just about to get out of the military, and this was kind of her last um, couple of months in. And so despite, you know, saying that we could always do a tendon transfer down the road, um, she wanted to proceed uh, at this point. And like everyone highlighted, it's, it's um, you know, the patients um, have, you know, a lot of autonomy in this and decision making. And so after, you know, saying, look, if we do this, you know, it may recover. Um, and then we've already done your tendon transfers, but realizing that um, she wanted to go ahead with it. And so I was okay with that at nine months uh, at this point. So uh, admittedly though, I, I am a more of a tendon transfer person. Um, and so I was going down that road with this patient just so I could get her uh, going quickly. And I knew that I probably wouldn't have um, uh, as long a follow-up um, afterwards. So uh, in this situation then, if you are gonna do a tendon transfer, uh, what, ty what type of tendon transfer would you do then? So an FCR base uh, described by a lot of people, popularized by brand, um, FCU, Jones, FDS, boys. I have a question for all panelists. Uh, when you are doing nerve repair or nerve grafting, are you stimulating the proximal stump of the nerve with, ox with a nerve stimulator for couple minutes or five minutes. Uh, Fraser. Hello. Fraser, you're on mute. Um, I, I don't, uh, I haven't so far, but I recognize that there is work going on that, that uh, may see some improved re with with intraoperative stimulation. So um, uh, that, that's not something I've done typically up to now. Yeah, likewise, I, I haven't. So when you do a uh, repair of the motor nerve, do you stimulate the nerve after you repair to see, let's say you are doing a functional muscle transfer to see is a good connection or not a repair or you are not doing anything? Uh, personally, I'm not doing anything. How about you, Peter? Uh, likewise, I, th I think that I don't know, would it, would it stimulate very much if it's been, you know, say six months and there's Wallerian degeneration and even if you connect it, would it, would it, I guess that I, like I never. In, in, in a muscle transfer, pre-functional muscle transfer, uh, they stimulate, you know, the donor oh, nerve to see yeah. what the muscle is contracting through the repair that you do. Right. At time zero for a free functional muscle. Absolutely. I think that would, I have seen, I have seen people do that. I, I have actually not done that before. Is Doug around? Is he doing it? The answer is not on purpose. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I think that, that all of this stuff is, is well-qualified witchcraft. And, and if you really try to go down to the absolute true science of it, it's not. I mean, we, I think we do what we would like to see. And I think that in the case that Peter has shown, you know, I would really, really like this lady to stay in the service for another six months. I'd really like to see what they're doing. But I certainly agree with you that, that after nine months, it's kind of like, let's get on with this. And I have a lot of patients that, that come to me after nerve transfers with a, can we get on with transfers and tendon transfers? And, and, and I do it and I approach it that way. But you no, know, Milan, I think that your question about stimulating is, is one of the things that I haven't done a whole lot of, 
but uh, you know, I always, especially in the acute setting, I, I kind of like to try to see if I can get that to happen. So. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Kristen, actually, I think you had these slides in there, which I think is super helpful. I think every fellow should just know radial nerve palsy tendon transfers should be, you know, right off the top of your head, um, uh, something that you can offer to all your patients. FCU based, uh, the Jones uh, transfer FDS based, uh, the boys, and then the FCR based. And they all have their pros and cons. The, the pro for the FDS would be that you don't have to um, bend your wrist to get full active extension. Um, and also the excursion uh, profile is much better uh, to match that of, a, of an extensor tendon to the finger. So a lot of benefits, um, pros and cons for any of these. Um, I like to do the FCR base like, um, like you said, Kristen, and uh, Dr. Stevanovich does. Uh, my incisions are slightly bigger. Um, I guess that's how we do it in the Midwest with uh, bigger, bigger patients maybe. Um, and then uh, you made a very good point that if you want to get your PT, which, which universally most people use for uh, reconstructing wrist extension to the ECRB, it, it behooves you to take a strip of the periosteum. But I guarantee you at some point that that's going to strip off uh, at the tendon periosteum junction. If it ever does, a good pearl is um, you can use your ECRL as a graft, interposition graft. Um, to give it a little extra length so that uh, you can help with your uh, tendon attachment distally. So if that ever happens, or if you don't want to take the time to harvest this periosteal rectangular strip, you can just use ECRL. It's, it's not functional um, and just extend that graft. And that, that has worked as a nice bailout um, when needed. But otherwise, the, surprisingly, that periosteum, when you tubularize it, um, it's pretty stout and pretty reliable. Um, I do make a yoke stitch first to make sure that all the tendons have an adequate excursion together and a composite finger extension, which I think is also quite helpful. That's proximal to the extensor retinaculum. And then you can do your, your uh, transfers, uh, whatever they are. Um, I'm just skipping the polls out of, sec uh, out of time. I guess my question is, uh, Dr. Savanovich, if it sounds like you like to do the FCR based transfer too, and recognizing that you know a third of patients may not have a palmaris longus what do you what do you do to restore uh finger uh, thumb extension do you just um, use a different donor tendon or do you put the epl to the ec mass what are your thoughts well i do uh superficialis of the ring finger as a uh term transfer for the epl if i don't have a palmaris longus uh, any of the other uh, faculty? Well, you know, I saw uh, cases that a uh, guy from Tehran uh, showed one plastic surgery, European meeting, having only one tendon. That's a flexor carpi ulnaris to transfer. He transferred all five tendons, you know, EPL and everything. And results was amazing. I have never seen that. So we shouldn't, uh, you know, abandon this type of the patient patient didn't have FCR, didn't have a, you know, superficialis. So what he did, he just used FCU, but uh, trans in dissect to about one third, to proximal third of the forearm, re-round that, and did a tendon graft, everything uh, on one tendon. And I was amazed with functional outcome of that guy. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I think in, uh, in certain cases, that, that may be the only thing you can do. Uh, so, Does any of the faculty have any other? Yeah, Dr. Dr. Boyce actually never, this is the drawings that I did for our chapter 10 transfer when I wrote for the uh, Hand Society book. Uh, and uh, David Green before that uh, wrote uh, that chapter. So they gave me to rewrite that. And I was uh, looking through the literature and found out that uh, uh, <coughs> Arnold uh, Henry, you know, the Henry approach, uh, extending Henry approach from uh, Ireland. Uh, he used flexor carpi radialis going through the interossal membrane, not around the radius. So I went to, to the literature, you know, and uh, uh, found that it was uh, published in 1916 in the Lancet. 
So I had a copy on Lancet and that was a surprise actually. That was done during the First World War in Serbia. He was a, a British uh, surgeon who helped the Serbian army and did the first time that and, and the results is really good, you know, whether you do through intraosal membrane or you do, you know, around the radius. So I sent that to David Green and said, this is most important <laughs> transfer that you forgot. Just give me show Tugi you. Tugi is the one who is his book, uh, uh, you know, published that. And it's amazing what uh, literature can show you. Yes, uh, but Milan, one thing that I, I learned from you is that that interosseous window has got to be a big window. Yes. Yeah. And that's yes. You know, and because that's not that's not written anywhere. It's kind of like the cook who saves the secret ingredient. Oh, we said that in our chapter. Oh, I, I and I learned that from you eventually. But in the original in the original chapters, that wasn't mentioned. Oh, boys, the boys even that never did any drawings. Yeah, all the drawings that you see in my chapter are done by uh, Tim Hanks, uh, who actually one time did work for Cooley for about nine years and after that went to uh, Hopkins and was main medical illustrator there. Fortunately, he's now here dean of the art school in LA. That's how I keep uh, close relationships with him. Yeah, it's uh, uh, like Dr. Mil uh, uh, Stavanovich said, it's, it just goes to show you that if you think about something that you think is innovative, it's probably already been thought of a long time ago. <laughs> So I, I also, if the Palmaris longus is not there, I'll use FDS and just like Dr. Handel had mentioned, making a big interosseous window so it doesn't uh, impinge or scar. Um, I had one question though uh, to ask the faculty before we close. For all these tendon transfers, what's your preferred method of doing your tenorophy? Um, the traditional pulver calf, side to side, end loop, single pass side to side, any thoughts? Pulver taft for me. Pulver taft? Pulver yeah. taft. Multiple pulver tafts. Yes. Multiple pulver taft. Yes. Agree. That's what, that's what I typically will do. Yeah, you yeah, can not be, I think you are safe. Okay. Yeah, and that certainly is strong enough. Uh, you know, there's, there's uh, recent literature in the past decade of different tenorophy constructs and biomechanical tests. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that have been described, and truthfully, they're probably all strong enough to withstand early rehab. I like to do a single pass, a single pulver tap, and then a side to side um, uh, crack cow running crack cow. That's it's very very strong. I think regardless of what you do, you have to be confident that you can move them very quickly. I think that universally will lead to uh, better outcomes. Yep. One day do the hand transplant, you know, cadaveric hand transplant, they do pulver tap so they can move the fingers immediately and stay well, you know, they don't rupture well. It is depends. I don't know, Fraser did this. Uh, how many Fraser you did at Duke? Two, three? Um, I, I was a part of the double hand transplant uh, team. I wasn't actually present for, for two of them. Well, I was able to see this young lady before she left the service at her final uh, three-month visit. And even then, you know, we, um, uh, for, for the tendon uh, tenorophies, I moved them within the first week in a protective uh, orthosis. And usually by about eight weeks, I let them get out of the uh, splint altogether and not do full uh, weight bearing or whatnot, but just normal activities is fine. I think that seems to help with uh, getting them to a pretty good state at three months um, in their recovery. Very nice. Great. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. We went over just about three minutes, but I think it's a very important topic, a hot topic on what to do with this, especially in this day and age in nerve, nerve uh, reconstruction and transfers. Thank you to Kristen and Wade. Thank you to Dr. Leversedge and Dr. Stamanovich and to everyone else that are joining us. And lastly, to the fellows, thank you for enduring what will go down is one of the most craziest years in medical training. You guys are better off um, than any of us, better prepared for what lies ahead. So thank you very much for your perseverance. Thank you for Jerry and Warren for uh, uh, getting these organized. Thanks for inviting me too. And congratulations. Thanks to everyone. Congratulations.
Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks to all the fellows as well. Thank you, Peter. That was great. Thank you, Milan thanks, and, Peter. and Kristen and Way. Great job. But yeah, I echo what Peter said. It's certainly a very challenging time for everybody, but hopefully this has been a kind of a great enhancement to your education throughout the year. And best of luck and congratulations in a couple of weeks. So stay safe, everybody. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye, everyone. All right. Thanks. Awesome job, Fraser. You're guided.